Hello everyone. My name is Amir Akbari and I'm a PhD candidate at the Department of Chemical Engineering of Penn State University. Today I'm going to talk about electrochemical case turbide formation for simultaneous phosphorus and potassium recovery from hog and dairy manures. So food security is one of the most important challenges of the 21st century. And to reach this goal, we heavily rely on fertilizers. It is predicted that the global population will grow steadily over the next three decades. And to come up with this trend and feed extra 2.3 billion people we need an annual increase of 4% in fertilizer production. Among different types of fertilizers, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus are considered as the most important macronutrients with the most market share or the biggest market share. A big portion of these fertilizers is consumed in animal husbandry so we can produce meat and other dairy products. In other words, we use nutrients to grow crops, to feed these animal farms. But at the same time, since all of these nutrients are not absorbed within the animal body, the rest end up in animal manure, producing a large amount of wastewater, which you can see on picture three. The common approach to manage these wastewaters is to keep them in holding ponds and then directly apply them to soil as a fertilizer. However, this approach has significant challenges and can cause major environmental concerns. For example, animal manure contains high level of phosphorus and ammonia or ammonia. Accumulation of phosphorus in water bodies can cause eutrophication. On the other hand, storing animal manure in open lagoons will result in loss of nitrogen to the atmosphere. These manures are heavy and bulky, so transporting them to external water treatment facilities will be very costly. Also, if we apply them directly to soil as a fertilizer, as a fertilizer, we cannot control the ratio between different nutrients, which is an important factor in agricultural applications. So we can see all these factors to some extent can cause and contribute to make the ecosystem unbalanced. Let's talk about phosphorus specifically. We all know that oil is a non-renewable energy. Phosphorus is the same, but there is a big difference that we can replace oil with renewable energy, but we don't have an alternative for phosphorus. At the same time, it is predicted that the phosphorus production peak will be somewhere between 2030 to 2080, which is pretty close. And to get phosphorus, we are mining it through phosphate rock, phosphorus, uh, phosphate rocks. The process makes gypsum byproducts, which are contaminated with radioactive materials and also heavy metals. It is very interesting to know that just five countries hold around 85% of the world remaining phosphate rocks, which makes this material a geopolitically important one and United States is not one of them. So here is a summary of the conventional peer renewal and peer recovery processes. So we are interested for peer, in peer removal to avoid environmental concerns, and we are interested in peer recovery as an advancement within the concept of circular economy and sustainability. So the first approach would be enhanced biological phosphate removal, EBPR. This process just enables us to recover around 10 to 30% of phosphate. And if we want to recover it as a struvite, which is ammonium magnesium phosphate and considered to be a useful fertilizer, we need external magnesium dosing. The other approach is called chemical phosphate removal or CPR. In this process, we need to add aluminum salts or iron salts such as aluminum chloride, aluminum sulfate, iron chloride, chloride, or iron sulfate. As a result, we remove the phosphate, but we end up producing solid wastes in form of aluminum phosphate or iron phosphate, which will need extra waste management. We are also adding salinity 
to the system and to the wastewater through chloride and sulfate. An interesting approach is chemical phosphate recovery, which is implemented by companies such as Ostara. So they are adding magnesium chloride and at the same time control the pH of wastewater to co-precipitate ammonium and magnesium and phosphate together as a stewart. However, this process also depends on external magnesium dosing, and we are at the same time still adding salinity to the wastewater by dumping chloride into the system. So here specifically, I will talk about electrochemical system as an alternative, an interesting approach, which attracts interest among scientific community these days. This is an example of an electrochemical reactor which consists of magnesium, pure magnesium anode and stainless steel cathode. Previous member of our group used this reactor to recover stewrite and remove phosphate and co-precipitate with magnesium and ammonium. This example shows co-precipitation of phosphate with calcium as calcium phosphate on the surface of the cathode. So on the surface of the cathode, as you can see here, local hydroxide production will increase the pH, which makes the environment thermodynamically favorable for co-precipitation of calcium with phosphate in form of calcium phosphate. In, in the other system, again, the hydroxide production near the surface of the cathode, which is here stainless steel, will increase the, rate, the pH of the solution and makes the system favorable for co-precipitation of ammonium with phosphate. So advantages of these electrochemical systems are that we don't need to add external chemicals to the system. So we will avoid that salinity problem. At the same time, we are recovering P as a fertilizer such as struvite or calcium phosphate. And these processes are solely rely on electricity, which makes them integratable with renewable energy in the future. Specifically focusing on animal manures, we see that the level of potassium is higher than municipal wastewaters. In my project, we are thinking about this concept of electrochemical reactor to co-precipitate phosphate with potassium and magnesium as a solid precipitate, which is called k white and could be used as a fertilizer, and then separate the extra or excess ammonia present in the system as a liquid or gas ammonia stream. So the objective of this project for now is to focus just on the k white part, and we are investigating the electrochemical precipitation of k white potassium fertilizer. So in conventional chemical engineering reactors, we use temperature and pressure to force the reaction to happen. But in electrochemical reactors, we use electricity to drive the reaction. So we are applying voltage or current to the system. And once I apply voltage to the anode, which is pure magnesium here, these analytic reactions start to happen. So you see that the magnesium becomes magnesium two plus. It means that the magnesium electrodes corrodes and then magnesium ions comes to the solution. At the same time, cathodic reactions are producing hydroxide and hydrogen. This hydroxide will, lo will, lo will locally increase the pH of the solution near the surface of the cathode and also gradually increase the overall pH of the system due to the circulation of the water. This process will make the system possibly favorable for producing and co-precipitation of potassium with phosphate in the presence of magnesium and giving us KMgPO4, which is case to it. And you can see it here in this picture. But before that, we should make sure that the type of precipitate that we are interested to produce is thermodynamically stable within the environment. To do so, we need to focus on saturation index values. Saturation index value is the log of ion activity product over KSP. 
So the KSP is a thermodynamic, thermodynamic solubility product of the salt or precipitate that we are interested, which can be determined experimentally. Ion activity product is the, for example, for KS2 white, is the activity of potassium multiplied by magnesium by phosphate. So by calculating this saturation index over a range of pH, we can, de and we can get these data points. If the saturation index of a material under each pH condition is above zero, then that material would be super saturated or stable thermodynamically under that condition. But if the value is below zero, it means that it's undersaturated. So for a sturbite, we see that under pH 9, the material would be unstable. But by increasing the value uh, to above 9, it gradually becomes stable. Sturbite is another story, and it's stable above pH 7 under all circumstances. I mean, under all pH values. So uh, I performed a thermodynamic modeling. Uh, based on the concentrations, our average concentrations that we see in animal manures. Uh, so I took the, I picked up a 3,500 milligram per liter concentration for potassium and 1,100 milligram per liter concentration for phosphate. And I fixed the magnesium to P ratio at 1.4. So we can see that this red curve, which shows the KS2 white stability that starts in, in undersaturation condition at low pH values, but gradually increases and becomes stable around pH 9.5 to 11. By increasing pH further above 11, this blue curve, which is magnesium hydroxide, becomes more dominant. The green curve is magnesium phosphate, which is a competing reaction within the system. Uh, so it is also important for us to take to keep this in mind. To perform an experiment and validate our thermodynamic modeling with experimental with different experimental conditions, we use a potential hole experiment, which means that we apply the constant voltage of minus 0.8 volt versus our reference electrode over 15 minutes. And the synthetic wastewater that we use just contained 15 millimolar KH2PO4. So at, for the first experiment, I fixed the pH at 4.5. I couldn't recover any precipitate from the bulk but I observed that a small amount of precipitate was, has been produced on the surface of the stainless steel, which is our cathode, which makes sense because the local pH would be higher near the surface of the electro, uh, cathode due to hydroxide production. Once I raised the initial pH and fixed it at 9.5, I see that, I saw that the precipitates formed in a stable, uh, condition, and I was able to recover it from bulk. To further analyze the composition and nature of these precipitates, we performed energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy. So KS2 white is a pretty new material found in 2004. So few literature reports are available on physical and chemical structure of this material. But the thing that we can see based on the reaction pathway is that we should see an equimolar ratio between magnesium, potassium, and phosphate. So for the precipitates recovered from the surface of the cathode, uh, which are the blue colors, uh, we see that the amount of potassium is less compared to magnesium and phosphate. But once we raise the pH to the stable conditions of 9.5, then the ratio of potassium to magnesium and phosphate is approximately one by one by one. What happens once uh, in, uh, under pH 4.5? We can assume that since the local pH is higher, a portion of this material, extra magnesium present in solid precipitates would be magnesium hydroxide. And also, this competing reaction of magnesium phosphate 
would play a role uh, to as the extra magnesium at phosphate uh, are present in, in, in the solid phase. So our future plans are focused on controlled pH experiments. So currently we are working on constant pH values of 9, 10, and 11. And we are trying to understand the role of water chemistry and pH on morphology and chemical and physical structure of precipitates. So you can see that at pH 9, which was the boundary condition for uh, case turbite stability, we are getting these pellet-shaped precipitates. And by gradually increasing the pH, we are getting a combination of needle-shaped crystals and pellet-shaped precipitates. And then at pH 11, uh, it is completely needle-shaped. To really understand the role of pH, we need to perform more characterizations. We are working on energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy and also FDIR and X-ray diffraction to fully characterize the nature of these materials. At the end, I should thank my supervisor, Professor Lauren Greenlee, for her continuous support. And also we are grateful to United States Department of Agriculture, specifically in NIFA Afri Water Food for water for food production systems for funding this study. Thank you very much. I would be happy to take any questions. So, so with the rats going in the uh, pH, and then we had a, I'm sorry. With the graph showing the effective pH towards the end there of put for potassium, magnesium, and and I can't remember the third third uh, struvite compound. Um, is it is it expected that those values would be the same? You're talking about the percentage. You're talking about the composition results, or the the very last slide with the microscopy. It had the bar chart to the percentage. Yeah, and then can you repeat your question? Sorry. Is it expected that they would all be the same percentage? If we have, if the majority of the precipitate is K-struvite, we would expect it to be approximately one to one to one because in that chemical formula, you have magnesium, potassium, phosphate, one to one to one. And um, if you, what we were worried about is that we would get more of the, either the magnesium phosphate, which is not as useful <laughs> as a recycled fertilizer or magnesium hydroxide, which is even less useful because then you're not capturing any of the phosphate. So we were really encouraged by the fact that we are seeing, you know, one to one to one. Yeah. Was the pH maintained till the end of the experiment? How do you control or maintain the pH? So um, it's a little bit, so right now we're just using, um, I think he probably has to use acid dosing to control, but in theory, you could actually use the electrochemical cell operation to control, um, but that's a bit, a little bit more complicated. So right now we just dose in to, to keep that pH. Dose in acid or based, yeah, to, to maintain, yes. Based on based on the uh, concentrations that you've used for uh, the, the solution that is used for recovery of k through white I saw um, 1,100 ppm of phosphate or uh, phosphate P being used. Do you foresee these concentrations? I mean, are these concentrations compared? Uh, how do these concentrations compare to manure liquid concentrations? Uh, yeah, so I know, um, I don't know the number range off the top of my head, but Amir did a pretty extensive literature review of Hagen dairy wastewater data in the literature, and there is a, there is a huge range. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily expect it to be that high. Um, we, if we chose that value to be on the higher end. It's also helpful with our, for, with our experiments to be a little bit on the higher end at this point. Certainly the values tend to be a lot higher than in the municipal sector, which is really where we started some of this work. Um, and we find that in the municipal sector, 
there's definitely engineering challenges around the fact that the phosphorus can be quite low. So actually in the agricultural realm, these wastewaters actually tend to have a lot more phosphorus than what we're used to in the municipal sector. 